Sophie Sergi was a student at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, where she was majoring in marine biology. In December 1992, Sophie underwent extensive orthodontic procedures and took the following semester off of school. Sophie was attending the university on a full academic scholarship, but needed to work to pay for the orthodontic work, as well as have time to recover from the procedures. Sophie therefore spent early 1993 in her hometown of Pitkiss Point, Alaska, living with her mother and younger brother. After her initial recovery, Sophie worked two jobs and traveled back to Fairbanks when she needed her braces adjusted. In April of 1993, 20-year-old Sophie made one of those trips to Fairbanks. She took the opportunity to spend time with her friend Shirley Wasuli and planned to spend the night in her dorm room on the second floor of Bartlett Hall on the university's campus. Sophie and Shirley spent the evening of April 25th with Shirley's boyfriend, hanging out and eating pizza. Shortly after midnight, Sophie left the dorm to go outside and smoke a cigarette. Witnesses would later report that she had smoked with a group of students just outside of the dorm building. At 1.30 a.m., Sophie had not come back to the dorm room. Shirley left her a note on the door saying that she and her boyfriend were going to sleep in a different room. When she came back to her dorm later that morning on April 26th, the note was still on the door and there was no sign that Sophie had slept in the room. Shirley called Sophie's orthodontist office and learned that she had not shown up for her appointment. Sophie's body was discovered by a janitor around two o'clock that afternoon. She was lying face down in a bathtub in the second floor bathroom of Bartlett Hall. She had not been found earlier in the day by the students using the sinks and showers because the bathtub was in a private room off of the main bathroom. Sophie had been stabbed, shot, and sexually assaulted. The medical examiner estimated that she had died in the very early hours of the 26th. Authorities interviewed everyone who lived in Bartlett Hall, but found very few leads. There was DNA found on Sophie's body, but no match to it was ever found in any police database over the years. A cold case unit from the Alaska State Police re-interviewed every resident from Bartlett Hall they could find in 2010, but still, no arrest was made in the case. Following the arrest of Joseph James D'Angelo, the alleged Golden State Killer, who was identified through genetic genealogy, the Alaska State Police decided to try the same approach in Sophie's case. They uploaded the DNA from her crime scene into GEDmatch, an open-source DNA database originally developed to help individuals research their family trees. On December 18, 2018, a forensic genealogist identified a woman who was a close relative of the contributor of the DNA. That woman was eventually found to be the aunt of 44-year-old Stephen Downs. Downs was already known to investigators. In 1993, he had been an 18-year-old student at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks and had lived in Bartlett Hall. His roommate, Nicholas Dazer, worked as a security guard and had helped secure Sophie's crime scene in 1993. When Dazer was re-interviewed by the Alaska State Police in 2010, he told them that Downs had kept an H&R 22 revolver in their dorm room. That weapon would shoot bullets consistent with the one found in Sophie, but the markings on the bullet were too general to match it to a specific weapon, according to a state forensic expert. When he was identified as a suspect in Sophie's murder, Downs was living in his hometown of Auburn, Maine. Since 2011, he had been working as a nurse, but he had a history of poor performance and inappropriate behavior. He lost a nursing job in 2016 for a totality of substandard performance, according to his record with the Maine State Board of Nursing. He was also accused of inappropriate behavior with two female co-workers at that job and had to complete a course on professional boundaries in nursing. Co-workers from his most recent job have come forward with allegations ranging from tampering with medications to mistreating patients. Several of his co-workers and patients reported being scared to be alone with him. The Maine State Police worked with the Alaska State Police to further investigate Downs. On February 13, 2019, they went to his home to interview him. He denied any involvement in the case, but said he remembered Sophie's face on posters that were put up after her murder and feeling sorry for her. The following day, the Maine State Police returned with warrants to collect a DNA sample from Downs and search his house. 
The DNA was tested and confirmed to be a match to the DNA found at Sophie's crime scene. On February 15th, Stephen Downs was arrested and charged with murder and sexual assault. He is currently fighting extradition to Alaska to face these charges. Between 1991 and 2006, a serial rapist, eventually dubbed the NorCal Rapist, assaulted at least 10 women in six counties in Northern California. He would force his way into victims' homes, restrain them, and rape them multiple times. He abducted some of his victims, taking them from their homes to force them to withdraw money from an ATM, which led to the infamous images of him on security footage, wearing a clear mask meant for burn victims. He apparently also stalked his victims. Two weeks after he assaulted a woman on Halloween of 1996, wearing a skeleton mask, he called the dental office where she worked. He claimed to be sorry. One of his other victims was Maki Anderson. In July 1997, she was a 21-year-old student at Chico State University. During her attack, she managed to break free of the restraints the NorCal rapist had used on her. He rebound her, but she broke free two more times. She then stabbed him in the arm with a pair of scissors. As was his habit, her attacker took Mackie's bedsheets with him in an attempt to limit the amount of evidence police had to investigate with. He left behind her pillowcase, though, and it had a sample of the blood he had lost in Maki's brave attempt to fight him off. This was just one of the sources of DNA the NorCal rapist left behind at his crime scenes. Police were never able to find a match to it in any database, however. In 2018, the sample was entered into GEDmatch. Within 10 days of entering the sample, authorities were able to identify a suspect through one of his relatives, surveil him, collect a straw from his garbage can, test it, confirm that the suspect's DNA matched the samples from the crime scenes, and make an arrest. The man identified and arrested was named Roy Charles Waller. Waller was arrested as he arrived to work on September 20, 2018. The 58-year-old worked as a safety specialist in the Environment, Health, and Safety Department at the University of California at Berkeley. On September 21st, the university released a statement saying that Waller was placed on investigative leave and that they will be reviewing all open on-campus sexual assault cases to confirm that Waller had not been involved in them. When Waller had his first court date on September 24, 2018, Maki Anderson was sitting in the second row of the courtroom. Waller was charged with 12 counts of forcible sexual assault, all stemming from an hours-long attack on two roommates in October 2006. After the hearing, Maki spoke with the media outside of the courthouse. I want him to know that he did not break me, she told them. He did not break me, and I know what he has coming to him. He needs to be locked up until he learns what it is to be human. The original dozen charges Waller faces could put him in prison for the rest of his life. However, the original 12 charges were only in connection to the one attack in Sacramento County. On January 7, 2019, he was also charged with 28 additional offenses in connection with the crimes in five other California counties. He is next due to appear in court on March 8, 2019. On June 13, 1993, a woman called the property manager for her apartment in a building in the 3100 block of Pillsbury Avenue in Minneapolis, Minnesota to complain that water was leaking into her apartment. The manager determined that the water was coming from a different unit in the building and let himself into it to investigate when there was no answer at the door. He found the water was coming from the shower, which had been left running. He also found a large amount of blood in the nude body of 35-year-old Jean Childs. She had been stabbed multiple times. Jean was a sex worker who brought her clients back to the apartment she was found in, which was rented by her boyfriend. He had been out of state at the time of her murder. Police collected several items from the scene that would eventually be tested for DNA, including a blue towel, a washcloth, a red t-shirt, a comforter, and a blood stain in the sink. The unidentified DNA found at the scene was never matched to any sample in police DNA databases. In 2018, authorities uploaded the unknown DNA to a commercial DNA database 
and worked with a forensic genealogist to identify the contributor of the DNA. Police have not disclosed which database they used, but it does not appear to be GEDmatch, as the Hennepin County attorney described it as a genealogy company you see advertised on TV. The genealogist identified two individuals with the right amount of shared DNA to the relative found in the commercial database. In investigating the two individuals, police found that one of them had moved to the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area in early 1991 and moved away six months after Gene's murder. His police record was mostly composed of traffic violations and driving while intoxicated convictions. However, he was also convicted in February 2016 for soliciting sex using the internet in 2015. In January 2019, police placed this suspect under surveillance and followed him to a hockey game. Police observed him buying a hot dog and wiping his mouth with a napkin before throwing it into a trash can along with the cardboard container the hot dog had been served in. They then collected the napkin and submitted it to the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Laboratory to look for DNA on it. There were multiple DNA signatures on it, but one of them matched the unknown sample from Gene's crime scene. Based on this match, police arrested the suspect, 52-year-old Jerry Rustrom, in February 2019. Westrom owned and operated several businesses, including an organic corn farm in Minnesota, and was an active supporter of 4-H and youth sports programs. He is married and the father of three children. A direct DNA sample was taken from him after his arrest, and it was confirmed to be a match to samples taken from the washcloth, the comforter, and the blue towel from the crime scene. Westrom spoke to police after his arrest and denied any involvement in Gene's death. He further claimed that he had never been in that apartment or in that apartment complex. He said he did not recognize Jean from her picture and denied having sex with any woman in Minneapolis in 1993. He could not explain why his DNA was found at the scene. Westrom was released on bail following his arrest. His family, as well as several friends, supported him in court for his first hearing. His attorney, Stephen Meshbesher, has told the media that his client intends to plead not guilty. He also claims that the evidence in the case is thin, and that his client's arrest was premature. Westrom is due back in court on March 13, 2019. 30-year-old Jack Upton was a popular and responsible manager at a Safeway grocery store in Fremont, California. His co-workers were therefore worried when he missed several shifts at work. On December 17, 1990, police were called to check in on him at his apartment. There, police found Jack's body, beaten and stabbed to death. His 1985 Nissan 300ZX was missing from the apartment complex's lot. A week later, the car was found in a mall parking lot in Thousand Oaks, California, more than 350 miles away. Police were able to lift fingerprints from inside of it. At the crime scene and in the car, police found matching blood samples that they could not identify, but believed came from Jack's killer. Authorities would periodically run the DNA from the unidentified sample through databases as they continued to improve over the ensuing years, but they were never able to find a match. In 2018, the Fremont Police Department contacted Parabon Nanolabs, who used forensic genealogy to identify Russell Anthony Guerrero as a potential suspect. In October 2018, Fremont Police traveled to Tempe, Arizona, where Guerrero was living, to begin surveilling him. They were able to collect a discarded DNA sample from him, which proved to be a match to the DNA found in Jack's apartment and car. Sometime after the DNA match was made, Guerrero's fingerprints were determined to be a match to ones found in the car. On January 17, 2019, Guerrero was charged with one count of murder by the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. On January 22, Fremont detectives arrested him in Chandler, Arizona. Authorities have not yet found a connection between Jack Upton and Guerrero, nor have they identified a motive for the crime. Guerrero does have a criminal record in several states. <laughs>